going out into the world, going all the many different countries, different cities, different kinds of people. Um, and and I, I concluded that um, through that pro- long process, wow, to my surprise, really, these conservative ideas um, are better for people. They're better for societies. They're better for economies. Um, they're, they're, they're better for um, uh, kind of family life. Um, so all those things that matter, they have much more to offer. And, and actually, the societies would be better off to be shaped by these ideas versus their, their, their opposing ideas. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny Burtka. Joining me today is Christopher Rufo, who is a writer, filmmaker, and activist. He has directed four documentaries for PBS, including America Lost, which tells the story of three forgotten American cities. He is a senior fellow of the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of the public policy magazine City Journal. He recently published a new book with HarperCollins called America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. He lives in the Pacific Northwest with his wife and three sons. Welcome, Chris. It's good to be with you. Great. Well, before we get to our interview, I'd like to thank the listeners for tuning in to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling this mission, be sure to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like ourselves. Well, Chris, congratulations on the new book. Uh, But before we actually dive into the topic of the book, I'm curious uh, if you could introduce our readers to your own uh, personal and educational background. Uh, where did you grow up, and what was your K-12 experience like? Uh, sure. Uh, good question. I, I grew up in Sacramento, California, uh, and I had a what I think of at the time as a typical K-12 through public school education. Okay. Um, you know, I, I kind of went to the neighborhood schools growing up in a suburban neighborhood in Sacramento, um, and, uh, you know, for, for, for better or for worse, uh, uh, had the kind of uh, typical, uh, the, the typical public school drill at, in, in, uh, at that time. Got it. Would you agree? I know one of my friends, Aaron Wren, who you probably know, has talked a lot about the, the transition from the neutral world uh, to this new world in which all these institutions are hostile. Would you say that your public school experience back in the, the aughts was that largely a a neutral space uh, compared to where it's at today? <laughs> well, I, I'm flattered. It was it was earlier than the aughts. It was the 1990s. Okay. Uh, right. But uh, but yeah, I mean, neutral is a tough word, right? Because the, the schools cannot be neutral. Um, sure. I, I don't think that education can be neutral. Um, but it, it obviously it felt as if it were neutral, um, and I think it was less uh, obviously ideological, and then. It was more pragmatic, more moderate, more uh, traditional at the time. And so, you know, even in California, I had a public school education that despite its limitations, which, you know, we can talk about, which were, were, were you know, significant in some ways, there was a basic consensus um, that, um, you know, America was a force for good. We were there to, to learn valuable skills, to develop knowledge, to, to have good relationships to have extracurricular pursuits like sports, or in my case, I did music, um, and that it was to prepare uh, the, the students at the high school level to, to enter a college and to go out into the world. And so um, it feels neutral. It wasn't neutral. It was uh, a specific time and place. Um, but, but you know, I, I, I wonder sometimes, actually, man, I wonder what my old schools are doing today. I wonder who the teachers are. I wonder what the culture looks like. I wonder what mm-hmm. the policies and administration are. I, I, you know, I spent a lot of time in the, uh, in, in the principal's office as a young, as a young kid. I was like, I wonder what, the, <laughs> I wonder what that office look like. Who's there? Is there a DEI person? Um, and so, so I'd actually be curious. Maybe I should go back and, 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 and see what it's like. But, but certainly from the reporting I've done in other public schools in California, uh, that system has changed completely. Mm-hmm. So you've not been invited back to give the keynote graduation speech <laughs> as of yet uh, at your public high school. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. It's such a mess. Who knows what they're up to? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. I mean, I went to public uh, high school as well in rural Michigan. And, you know, it was probably similar. It was a few years later, I think, 04 to 08. Uh, and, and I would say that I was probably one of the only... Um, you know, sort of uh, 
kind of like public, like I was a Christian and people knew that I was a Christian and had socially conservative values. But so I was one of those, you know, one of the few people that was like that. Uh, but, you know, by and large, like what was being taught to us was whatever like Houghton Mifflin textbook said about the New Deal or something. So there's probably a progressive sort of inflection in the presentation. But, you know, if you were judging by today's standards and looking at this rural public school and saying, like, is this a right wing or conservative school? You know, I can guarantee you that probably 80 percent of the parents of the kids probably voted for Trump in the last two elections. <laughs> so yeah. uh, but it, it definitely wasn't a, a conservative environment, but it was sort of in this weird, you know, it was the odds. I don't, I don't really know know what else to say. I'll tell you something interesting. Um what I've seen with my oldest child, who's now middle school, um, the, 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 the boys, I, you know, I kind of have more interaction with the boys because he's a boy. All his friends are boys. But, um, you know, the boys are, 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 are somewhat reactionary. Uh, it's actually quite, <laughs> it's quite fun to watch. They're, they're very skeptical of the kind of left-wing politics. They're skeptical of, the, you know, the kind of woke politics. They're skeptical of the gender politics. Um, and, uh, and so I do wonder if, if, if the generationally it's engendering a backlash uh, sure. as far as the, the generational uh, change. And so um, it's kind of funny, actually, because I, I, I was I was more um, uh, rambunctious, I guess you could say, kind of nicely um, in, 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 as, as, a, as a student kind of rebelled against the authorities and administration at the time, um, you know, <laughs> maybe not with great justification looking back, um, but but they're also rebelling now against the authority of the kind of left wing hegemony within the institutions. And I think they're doing so with, with great justification. And so, you know, my parents would look to me and say, Oh, he really, you know, ought to take it easy. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't uh, cause trouble in school. Uh, I look at my kids and say, you know, go for it. <laughs> like yeah. you should cause trouble in school. If that's what they're saying, you know, go at them, you know, you know d- debate, you know, attack, sure. you know, f- you know, fight, fight it out with people. Uh, so yeah, maybe we can have a generational alliance. Yeah. I've seen some charts showing that that reaction to the this, these progressive politics. You, you see a lot of young young men and boys are reacting strongly and becoming more conservative, but a lot of young women are becoming more liberal. Do you think we'll also see that reaction among women, or do you think it's it's largely men that are reacting this way? I mean, just speculating, I, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure I would put much uh, money on it, but I, I would say that I think we'll see it with women, but I think we'll see it with a delay. Um, okay. I think we'll see it later in the, in the life cycle for women. And um, I think that they, that, you know, look, the, the left-wing gender politics uh, has a lot superficially to offer to women. I mean, it just mm-hmm. does, right? Um, but I think that as women get a bit older, they start to see the cracks and the flaws and the limitations and the, and, and the problems with it. I think it has the, the kind of, you know, kind of, let's say the right, right wing, uh, you know, interpretation or, or reaction has something immediate to offer y- young boys and men, right? This is kind of obvious sure. in their immediate experience. So I think it'll just be a kind of delay. I think that, that it will, the, the insights, hopefully... Uh, will hit will hit at just at a different uh, age, a different part of the cycle. But then again, you know, I'm also seeing among the the girls, even in middle school, um, you know, they 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 they're 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 looking at their lives, they're looking at their parents, they're looking at their families. They might actually learn something um, uh, er, earlier than, let's say, you know, my generation, millennials. I think you're probably millennial as well. Um, yeah. I think it's tough for 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 women in our age. So tell me about your experience as a documentary filmmaker. What are, what's the favorite? What's your favorite film that you've that you've made? How did you get into that craft? Oh, uh, favorite film? I I, I don't know. I, I uh, it's like you know, which is your favorite child? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I shouldn't shouldn't quite say, but uh, um, I, I got into it after college. I wanted to do something. Um, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to have some adventure and some excitement and. I really fell into the the career kind of kind of by accident, by happenstance, and then kind of made a run at it for for more than ten years. Um, and uh, and then as I got older, you know, it's a tough business, um, it's a tough life uh, style, it's a tough you know tough tough way to uh, 
uh, to kind of pers- per- persist. And I, I, I grew somewhat disillusioned with it. And, and part of it was because the documentary world is, you know, monolithically left wing and just mm-hmm. obnoxiously identitarian. And, and I just, at a certain point, I, I really just couldn't stand the culture of the industry, the, the, the people in the industry. Um, and then and, and so I decided to make a bit of a shift and, and move into politics not that long ago, like five years ago, something like that mm-hmm. um, made it made a shift. So Four years that, ago. with that shift into politics, what was, you know, what was the that aha moment where you said, OK, the DEI, the CRT stuff, that's that's what I want to make my life's mission, taking that on as opposed to any other you know, sort of major issue facing facing the country today. Sure. I mean, a, a bit by experimentation, by, by, by some serendipity. So I, I got some, I developed sources within some of the institutions, first in Seattle, the, the region where I live, um, actually the city I was living in at the time. I developed sources. I published some stories about these, what I thought were one-off trainings and ideological programs. And then I started getting, um, uh, a lot more people reaching out. I got hundreds and then thousands of sources. And so I'm sifting through all these documents, videos, audio, PDFs, emails, whatever, you know, uh, you know, all of this raw material from American institutions. And that's when I realized that this is a big untold story. I have hmm. privileged access uh, to, to in, an insight into this. And so I started really sequencing these stories and really working on this. And then um, it turned into a, a big issue after President Trump took it on as an issue. Um, and then I was thrust into this polit- big political fight um, and, and, and to a position of leading this big political fight. And so I thought that, wow, this is a, an exciting challenge. This is a very uh, you know, fascinating topic. This is a, 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 a big you know, wave that, that has now been unleashed through my reporting. And so I decided to really pursue it and to, to work on it as a reporter, as an activist, as a policy uh, uh, analyst, and then as an, as an author, um, culminating uh, in the publication of this book. Hmm. And a question on institutions as relates to you know, the focus of your work today. Uh, as you mentioned, it was probably, what, five, you said five years ago that you really got into politics. And... You know, it seemed like obviously you'd been laying the groundwork, doing investigative reporting, doing some policy stuff. But it seems like, you know, Chris Rufo sort of came out of nowhere. Like, at least in, in, in my world, all of a sudden, it's like one day I turned on the news, turned, you know, logged onto Twitter and it was just Chris Rufo everywhere. And, you know, oh, you've man. had this this experience, right, where you you have had and continue to have affiliations and relationships with conservative movement institutions, uh, you know, with the Manhattan Institute. Um, I believe you were affiliated with Heritage at one point. Uh, but at the same time, you have accomplished so much as an individual, right? I think in, in many respects, you've you've accomplished as a single human being more on this education, in, uh, education I- issue than probably, you know, dozens of conservative think tanks uh, have, who have spent probably tens of millions of dollars. Now, of course, there's a symbiotic <laughs> relationship here, but do you think that the Chris Rufo option, so to speak, you have the Benedict <laughs> option, you have the Chris Rufo option. Is this, um, I don't know, is this the path forward for kind of important but niche issues that the right needs to tackle today? What's the relationship between sort of the the great man or woman taking on a particular issue and these long-standing conservative institutions. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So I, I, I guess the, the 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 key question is, well, what is your theory of of political change? What is your, mm-hmm. um, you know, h- h- how do you then make decisions and and make investments, and what do you put money towards? And I think it requires both. I I, I think that you know I'm not a typical kind of born and bred conservative by any means. I'm, my background is very atypical uh, for a lot of the movement conservatives. Um, you know, I, I wasn't a college Republican uh, or, uh, or, or anything like that. I didn't do any of the, you know, kind of, do kind of uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, um, work early on. And I, I kind of came in laterally a bit later in life. Um, but, uh, but I think that, 
what I've maybe demonstrated to others, and I, I'd like to actually help other people develop this, um, is a new way of attacking political problems. I think it's a more entrepreneurial way, um, a bit more uh, um, 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 high energy, high risk, high, con- high conflict. Um, um, and, and it's using journalistic skills, using storytelling skills, using uh, new media skills, um, to, and then connecting a lot of the, the more media work to actual concrete policy objectives and, and, uh, and some institutional objectives. So I'm still working on it. Uh, and I think that I have great relationships, you know, with Manhattan Institute, you know, most prominently, I run my own shop uh, here. Of course, I'm, I'm working with you, with you and the ISI at, on the fellowships, um, but I'd like to develop a bit of a uh, maybe formalize and, and think about what I'm doing, how it's been successful, how it might help others do something similar. And I would love to see, um, you know, some high impact uh, people and young people, especially on our side, using some of the, the ideas and strategies and tactics that I'm developing and pushing on other issues. Because I can see a lot of issues where I say, oof, if I were to really focus on this, I could see exactly how to move the needle. Um, no. And 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 look, I mean, not to not to badmouth, you know, uh, call it friends and colleagues, but as friendly criticism, um, we do have a lot of institutions that it is really not clear what the outcomes that they drive are. Um, and so, I, I'd like to see that to be much more clear. I'd like to see that to be much more aggressive. Um, and I think certainly in, infusing some energy and infusing, you know, maybe some Chris Rufo style politics uh, could really benefit uh, these organizations and actually really help them um, drive results. Hmm. I, I agree. And before one more question before we get to the, the explicit topic of your book, but shifting from institutions uh, to language. Um, you do an excellent job, and this is, I think, part of your the tactic and what you've brought to the table, using the power of language and clearly defining your terms in a way that communicates your ideas so that your ordinary person can really understand what you're talking about, you know, when you use the, the word CRT, for example. So I'm wondering, uh, how do you think about the power of language and the role of definitions um, in your work more broadly? Yeah, I, I think, look, language is crucial. I think that um, the left has um, a, a lot of uh, people, a lot of operatives, a lot of strategists that are very high skilled in developing language, and much of the common language that we speak today is is, is ideological in nature. Um, it, it it favors, uh, it has a kind of bias towards left wing ways of thinking, left wing uh, uh, ac- actions, and and advancing left wing goals. And so, for me, it's actually just a fun uh, you know a fun pursuit to try to figure out. All right, well, what is the language that we have today? Which which language is corrupted? Which language is inaccurate? Which language is false or or or, or, you know, it's kind of ugly. Uh, and then how can we tell a story with language that is new, uh, fresh, accurate, persuasive, um, and advances uh, the kind of ideas and, and policies that I'd like to see? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then unapologetically playing the game. Um, and, and, and look, I mean, it, it is a game. It's a contest. It's a competition. Um, it is a contest for, um, you know, uh, for, 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 uh, you know, which ideas uh, be, attain power and which ideas, you know, are relegated to, to, the, to the fringes. And so conservatives have to get much better at, at language um, if they want to uh, see better ideas um, actually, you know, attain, um, attain power in politics, attain um, a place in academia, for example. And and that is that's something that I think is 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 for the right kind of person something that could be really fun. I I agree. And how would you on that point? How would you define C- CRT? Yeah, I, I mean, luckily with stuff like critical race theory, you actually don't have to de- redefine it. You, you you can just look at what they say and just repeat right. it. Uh, it. It's so um, it, it's so unpopular. Because the ideas and the component parts of the ideology are inherently unpopular with the majority of Americans, including many people on the kind of center left. So you could just Mm -hmm. say very simply in their own terms, CRT holds that the United States is a systemically racist nation and all American institutions preach the values of freedom and equality. But this is really a mask for racial domination and Mm -hmm. that critical race theorists have 
a privileged uh, insight into ferreting out the racism within institutions, and they advocate for uh, a kind of significant government intervention uh, to achieve uh, racial equality um, uh, by force, uh, you know, through government policy. And so that, that's neutral. I actually think that they would agree with that. If you said, hey, is this an accurate description of CRT? Maybe with some quibbles, they'd say, yeah, pretty accurate. Um, and then, of course, you can make the arguments against it. That's fine. But I found that actually just, just, just showing people what it is is more than enough to motivate opposition. Mm-hmm. So more directly on the topic of your book, America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything, uh, can you, you know, talk about some of those histor- the early historical intellectual influences that are really responsible for the, the genesis of, of critical race theory and critical theory more broadly? Sure. Yeah, that, that's that's how I that's how I build the book. The book the book is built in four parts: um, revolution, race, education, and power. So mm-hmm. those are the four categories that I've chosen to to divide the book. And then each of those each of those parts uh, is anchored with a biographical portrait of the let's say the founder of of, the, of these theories. Uh, you know, so you have Herbert Marcuse, the German American. Uh, Neo Marxist philosopher. He's the he's the beginning. His theory of revolution. You have Angela Davis, who of course was the kind of preeminent black radical and communist uh, party activist of the 1960s and 70s. She's anchors the chapter on race uh, for obvious reasons. Um, you have Paulo Freire, who's a Brazilian uh, Marxist pedagogist that is actually the the, the most uh, cited and most um, assigned uh, author in graduate schools of education in the United States. He then, of course, uh, is anchors the education section. And then finally, Derek Bell, the Harvard law professor who was the godfather of critical race theory. He was the mentor who, who really assembled the, the, the structure um, uh, and, and the discipline, uh, the subdiscipline of critical race theory um, w- was really done by his students in consultation, w- uh, of course, with their, with their mentor, Derek Bell. And so it's, it, it traces the biographies the ideas, how the ideas move through the institutions, and then the consequences of those ideas in American society. That's the basic narrative structure of the book. Okay. And was there, uh, you know, I know when you set out to write the book, uh, I'm sure you knew that a lot of these ideas, you know, both the, the, the ideas themselves were pretty, pretty rotten, pretty corrupting in, in nature, but also their manifestation in education. And as we're starting to see in, in business, we're also corrupting uh, but was there anything that that in particular surprised you in your reading and your research or in your investigations that you thought, you know, wow, that was actually that's actually a lot worse than I thought it was going into this? <laughs> yeah, over, over and over and over. Yeah, okay. I had that, that, that experience many, many times in the research. And, you know, one one small anecdote that I that I believe is representative that that illustrates the point that you're making is. Something that still is, is, is fairly shocking to me as I look back. But, you know, I spent a lot of time reading radical literature, pamphlets, manifestos, you know, uh, communiques, calls to act, calls to arms from the radical groups in the 60s and 70s. The Black Panthers, the Black Liberation Army, the Weather Underground, Communist Party USA, etc. And I also spent a lot of time looking at, well, where, you know, looking at the ideas today in my reporting, looking at school curriculum, looking at lesson mm-hmm. plans, looking at, looking at uh, teachers, you know, teacher training materials, all of these leaked materials that I've been getting from institutions. And if you hold them up side by side and you break them down, you know, the language is a little different. It's more euphemistic now. It's a little bit more formalized. It's passed through, you know, multiple layers of bureaucracy. But if you break it down to the basic key concepts, the key ideas, the key, key ideological line that they're taking, in some places, they're not much different. The mm-hmm. Black Panther Manifesto and the Buffalo Public Schools BLM curriculum. I mean, if, if, if you just took snippets out and you said which sure. one is which, you might not be able to tell. And so that's kind of amazing. I mean, these people were, were violent terrorists. They were assassinating police officers, robbing banks, holding hostages. Um, you know, they were actual terrorists, meaning they terrorized the, the public for, and used political violence to advance their object. And then, you know, what they're teaching kindergartners in, in, in Buffalo, New York today, um, uh, to me, that's just a a kind of shocking transmission 
um, that mm-hmm. I that I that I that I think is is it would be surprising to most readers. What on that point? What does the left understand, or what do these radical groups going back to the '60s understand about power uh, that conservatives, you know, should should take note of? And is there something special or unique about left wing ideas that uh, make it very easy to just so quickly integrate and radicalize institutions? Or could you envision uh, conservative ideas or right of center ideas? moving, you know, with, with equal speed through institutions in the other direction? Well, I, I think it'd be much more difficult um, because the, the, the left promises total liberation from constraints, uh, responsibility, uh, human mm-hmm. nature, um, you know, uh, privation, uh, you know, want, uh, desire. I mean, it's like desire. It's like, you know, what, what they promise is, is so grandiose, so idealistic, so utopian, uh, in some ways, but then also plays into your basest instincts, you know, motivates mm-hmm. your desire, greed, revenge. Um, it's like a symphony uh, of, uh, of, of affect uh, and, and desire. And then they say, yes, you get this all right now. Um, so conservatives, on the other hand, it's about, you know, restraint, uh, prudence, um, limitations of human nature, uh, you know, good government, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, you know, wisdom, cultivation of wisdom over a long time, patience, um, you know, stewardship. Uh, you're, you're not going to get people excited about those ideas in the same way. You're not going to be able to, 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 to get people, um, you know, motivated in the same way. So conservatives are at a disadvantage. And, and, and traditionally what you, you'd have is you had an element of change. It's important. An element of, of restraint or, or discipline or contemplation. And those would work together in, in a kind of nice way so that change was more gradual, change went through a process of reflection. The, the worst ideas were weeded out. The best ideas that survived that process were, uh, were, were kind of permitted by the society to continue. That system of balance is, is, is no longer in place. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see if that, that balance can be restored. And, and I think that what's happening on the right today as well is that because that balance has now been uh, destabilized, because that's no longer the, the, the status quo within institutions, you have a, a political right that is much more interested in, in aggressive action, uh, reforms, um, you know, radicalism, kind of philosophical radicalism. Um, and so I think that's why you're actually seeing a, a kind of a ferment on the right of creativity, um, you know, vis-a-vis or, or rather in comparison to uh, the old right that was a bit more of a stabilizing force. Um, mm. You know, the, 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 the right, I think, now actually has to, um, has to be, uh, in some ways, a, a, a destabilizing force in the short term to break up some of these captured institutions mm. with the vision of ultimately being a stabilizing force uh, in the end. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a difficult task that we have. Definitely. But, you know, you've seen quite a few policy victories, especially in, in red states since you begun your work. And even recently, there's an interesting phenomenon going on where you have Muslim communities, for example, in the Detroit, Michigan area, Dearborn area, uh, objecting in a pretty aggressive way to, you know, the, the sexualization of, of children in public schools. You even see it among Latino communities reacting against, you know, phrases like Latinx or against sort of anti-American uh, curriculum and politics in particular. Uh, what do you, how do you, looking forward, you know, does, do these sort of, I don't know, these reactions, these new reactions have anything to, to say about the, the coalition that will form to oppose uh, both CRT and gender ideology? I, yeah, I do. I think that that's, you know, conservatives should tap into that energy and that public sentiment and, and seek to guide it and rationalize it and move it forward into the political process. Um, and then if you look even at just um, affirmative action policies, let's just say affirmative action is in, in, in broad strokes, uh, the kind of policy prescription of critical race theory. It's, it's more than that. I mean, it's a, it's a whole kind of revolutionary theory, but in its limited, pragmatic, practical, political form, affirmative, CRT advocates want affirmative action. Race-based preferences, race-based redistribution, race-based you know, reparations, you know, race-based 
uh, policy making to, to, to uh, equalize group outcomes. Affirmative action is very unpopular. You know, very few people support it. Um, and even in places like California and Washington State, where voters have, have contemplated this question and voted on this question in, in ballot initiatives, they rejected affirmative action. In California and in Washington State, two of the most left-wing states uh, uh, in, in the union. And this, to me, suggests that conservatives have a massive opportunity to advance a political project on these issues that galvanizes a new majority of voters. And what's limiting conservatives is fear of talking about these issues, of talking about race issues at all, um, and incompetence, uh, lacking the skills, uh, lacking the skills uh, uh, to, to, to make an issue out of this. Um, and so, you know, you have a bit of fear and incompetence on our side. Uh, it's a limitation, certainly, but I don't think it's, an, it's something that can't be overcome. And so if we can develop the, the competence, the skill, um, and, and, and the courage to turn these issues uh, into real, uh, real politics, and I, I think that we will be, um, we will be rewarded uh, by the public, by public sentiment, by voters, uh, by legislators. Um, and, I, and I think, look, we have to push on these issues. And, and in my view, the, the Supreme Court that, that you know, ruled against affirmative action in the Harvard case, is not the, it's the beginning, not the end. Um, but it also creates more space for conservatives to, to fight. You, know, you, you, you saw the reaction to the Harvard case, the affirmative action case. There was really no left, great left-wing outrage or outcry. They don't even fight for this stuff. It's mm-hmm. so baked into our society. Um, and I think most in, intelligent, um, you know, kind of intellectually honest people on the left, I mean, it's a very uncomfortable and very distasteful position to be arguing for race-based, uh, you know, preferences, race-based segregation of employees, you know, race-based repar- I mean, they, they really don't have this wholehearted support for it because they know, I think, in their heart of hearts that it is wrong, that it is uh, against the spirit of equality, treating people equally as individuals, and conservatives should press them on it. Mm-hmm. I, I hope you're right that they know that it's wrong. I, I worry that especially in these very bureaucratic institutions that it's just baked into the, the logic of the place so much that they it is, it can't is. see outside the tower. I, I'm curious what, you know, practically speaking, you know, if you were president of the United States or education uh, secretary, you know, how do you, is there, I, I understand what it's like to, attempt to reform new college or the Florida education system when you have a sympathetic governor behind you. Even then, it's, it's challenging to implement it in practice. How do you go about, through public policy, actually reforming the university system writ large when the Harvards of the world right, are going to be, uh, you know, the Supreme Court says you can't do affirmative action, they say, oh, that's fine. You know, we're just going to ask kids to whatever, talk about an experience they had with race and their background. We're going to get the information another way. Like, so how do you actually, what, what are the ways, what are the top three things you would do to actually bring about reforms in these institutions if you had the power? Yeah, I, at the federal level, you know, there's a, there's a few things you could do. You, you, first, you stop the massive public subsidy for universities through these student loan schemes. I mean, cut off the money um, and, and, and make these universities, especially private universities, subject to market discipline. And I think mm-hmm. that you're going to get uh, uh, some changes there. Um, Can you, you will, do that you without will... congressional approval? Can you do that purely through executive actions? <laughs> I, would, I would have said no. I don't, I don't think so. I doubt it. Um, maybe there's something you could do around the edges. You'd have to get some, some aggressive lawyers in there. But but I, I think you could, you know, you could certainly do it with, with congressional approval. Um, um, I, I would also, um, you know, put, uh, 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 restri- put rather, um, uh, you could design a certain set of uh, rules and requirements that are attached to federal support. So you could say that in order for a university to qualify for federal support, you have to demonstrate uh, uh, kind of, you know, a, a good free speech policy, a kind of uh, open, open, open campus debate policy. Mm-hmm. You have to have these kind of shared principles, institutional uh, neutrality on, 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 on certain issues using public funds. Um, you, could, you could attach some, some requirements there. 
And then what I think you really want to do, and, and this is something that I would love to, to work on, um, should we be so fortunate to have the opportunity and after 2024, um, is you mobilize a large task force at Department of Education and Department of Justice um, to systematically investigate all of the elite universities, start with the top 10, start with the Ivies, in, 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 you know, in a sense, um, and systematically investigate them for um, uh, race-based discrimination, for mm-hmm. racial scapegoating, um, for uh, uh, creating a, a, a hostile work environment uh, on the basis of their uh, racial training programs, um, uh, investigate them, uh, in other words, uh, uh, for systemic racism. Uh, you could even borrow the word. Um, and, and, and actually um, investigate them, hold them in, in front of Congress, get the documents, get the subpoenas, um, you know, file lawsuits against them, uh, have, 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 have financial and maybe even criminal penalties uh, for people who are found to buy, in violation of the civil rights law. Um, and and in, in a sense, what you're doing is you're taking the civil rights apparatus and you're mm-hmm. repurposing it um, to attack the critical race theory, theory style policymaking, which I think is, uh, which there's a good argument that, that, uh, that, it, that it would violate some of our, uh, some of our laws and, and certainly some, of, as we've seen with Harvard, our, our constitution and make it very uncomfortable with them. And look, you can't really penalize a, 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 a sta- you know, a Stanford or a Yale or a Princeton financially. They have too mm-hmm. much money. But what you can really punish them on and really change their behavior on is their status, their prestige, and their reputation. And so if you haul these people in, you embarrass them, you confront them with documents, you sue them, you investigate them, you go through all their dirty laundry, you show that they are upholding racist, unconstitutional, and illegal practices, um, and then you make them subject to, to, to the appropriate penalties, I think then you'll, you'll change the incentives because you'll, 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 they'll say, uh-oh, you know, we can't get away with this stuff anymore. Um, we've got to change because that was a, an awful, absolutely awful experience. And we're, we're degrading the brand and the reputation of our institutions. I think mm. you need that kind of level of toughness uh, in order to change. Definitely. So last question. I know uh, don't want to keep you too long. I know you've been doing the, the book circuit uh, the last few weeks. You mentioned yeah, that yeah. you didn't grow up sort of as part of the, the conservative movement institutionally. I'm curious just about your own, you know, political, intellectual views. Like how do you sort of understand where you're at uh, ideologically and, you know, what inspirations and sort of sources and ideas and thinkers really motivate you? Yeah, I mean, you know, so so many. And, um, you know, I, I think that I, I became a conservative because I found that the conservative uh, work that I had been reading in my 20s and the kind of self-education that I had been doing um, was, was more closely aligned with and compatible with the reality that I observed in the work that I was doing in documentaries. So going out into the world, going all the many different countries, different cities, different kinds of people. Um, and and I, I concluded that um, through that pro- long process, wow, to my surprise, really, these conservative ideas um, are better for people. They're better for societies. They're better for economies. Um, they're, they're, they're better for um, uh, kind of family life. Um, so all those things that matter, they have much more to offer. And, and actually, the societies would be better off to be shaped by these ideas versus their, their, their opposing ideas. And, uh, and so that's really what, what still, still motivates me and, uh, you know, I, I've made also a lot of friends in the in the conservative world. I, I don't have any more friends on the le- on the left uh, like I used to. The, those those friendships are are pretty much over. Um, and so I found that uh, you know conservatives are and, and kind of movement conservatives are um, you know very friendly, very helpful, very genuine, um, uh, uh, very principled. Um, they, they try to live by their, their, their values and their, and their beliefs and principles. And, uh, and I've also found uh, something that's exciting that I think is maybe different is conservatives are actually the last people that are open to debate. You know, they're, they're open to discussion with people who disagree. They're, they're, they're happy to participate um, in, in institutions that have a, a pluralism or a, or a, or a diversity of, of ideas. They're, and, and conservatives, I think, are more open uh, to make alliances with uh, 
center left, you know, with atheists, with Muslims in uh, you know Detroit on gender, and and so I, I think there's a certain openness that that is maybe not has not always been there, um, and I think that's good. I think that there's a certain openness, um, a certain creativity, um, uh, and when I think of the the left and, and my own participation in the left and the documentary world. I find it just absolutely hostile to creativity. Um, hmm. I mean, it, it's like, you know, ideology rules and, cre- you know, creativity, you know, suffers. And so that, that to me, is not a very exciting environment to, to work, live and work in. Hmm. Well, on that note, we will wrap up our interview. I'd encourage all of you to go out and get a copy of America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. And Chris, if our listeners want to follow their work, follow your work, where should they look? Yeah, find me on Twitter at RealChrisRufo or, uh, or go to rufo.substack.com. That's rufo.substack.com and you can get all my latest work. Great. Well, thanks for joining us and thank you all for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.